My name is Simon Tran and I'm ProPublica's events associate. Welcome to what New Mexico needs to know about taxes in 2021. Tonight's event is sponsored by McKinsey and Company and co-presented by ProPublica and Code for America. So for those of um, who are new um, to us, welcome. ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. We're currently growing our coverage of the Southwest, so it's great to be in conversation with New Mexico tonight, as well as folks outside of New Mexico. Welcome. Code for America is a civic tech organization that uses technology to design equitable government services. And they operate getyourrefund.org, a national coalition that provides free tax filing assistance to low income families. Today, we'll talk about both our country's broader tax system and the tax filing process. To help guide us through this, we're joined by David Newville, Senior Program Director of Tax Benefits at Code for America, where he oversees getyourrefund.org. David previously served as Vice President of Policy and Research at Prosperity Now, a nonprofit focused on building financial security for working families, as well as a Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Jeffrey Ledbetter is the Director of Tax Health New Mexico, an organization where he's been at for 10 years. He's also worked at the United Way of Central New Mexico and has been preparing taxes for 30 years. Tax Health New Mexico has 31 sites across the state of New Mexico and into the Navajo uh, Reservation. And that in a non-COVID year, there's just over 17,000 new Mexico taxpayers. So I just want to say thank you again to um, our panel for joining tonight. One note, uh, this session is not designed to give advice about your personal tax or specific financial situation. Rather, it's intended to provide resources and information to clarify the often confusing steps and requirements of the tax filing system. Also, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who is registered. So before we jump into the panel, to kick things off tonight, we will first hear from ProPublica reporters who have reported extensively on the tax prep industry and the IRS to provide context about the systemic issues that can make taxes so complicated. We have a brief video that summarizes uh, their findings across four key areas. And it's about 10 minutes long, so let's watch. Hi, I'm Justin Elliott. I'm Paul Keel. And I'm Lydia DePillis. We're investigative reporters at ProPublica covering business, economics, and politics. We're here today to talk to you about tax filing services, the IRS, and what you can expect during this year's tax filing season. We'll talk about our reporting from the past several years on these issues, as well as information you need to know for this year. The modern history of how we do tax prep in the United States really begins uh, about two decades ago, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, around the turn of the millennium. And that was a period in which uh, more and more Americans were getting personal computers, people were, uh, people were getting onto the internet, um, and uh, everyone at the time filed their taxes using paper forms. Um, but there, there were people inside the government who were uh, thinking a lot about the potential of the internet. Um, and there was a proposal actually during the early years of the George W. Bush administration um, to get the IRS to create a new uh, online 
electronic tax filing system. And the idea was this was going to be a free option that any taxpayer could use, uh, you know, made by the government uh, in alternative to sending in the paper forms that everyone had been doing uh, for so many years. Um, Intuit, uh, the Silicon Valley company that uh, makes TurboTax, um, at that time already had a very lucrative business uh, selling TurboTax software. Um, and uh, immediately when the Bush administration put forth this proposal to have the IRS create a government uh, free tax filing system into it and the rest of the tax prep industry saw this as a potentially existential threat to, uh, to their growing tax prep business. Uh, the companies uh, embarked upon a very aggressive lobbying campaign um, that was ultimately successful in beating back this uh, free IRS uh, tax filing proposal. Um, the way that they killed the proposal was they basically made a deal with the government. This was sort of uh, an early public-private partnership in technology. And the, this was, it was, it's called the free file deal. Um, and the basic deal going back to the early 2000s was the tax prep industry led by Intuit um, promised the government that they would offer uh, a free version of their software to most Americans. Um, and in exchange, the IRS had to promise never to create its own public uh, tax filing option. Um, this uh, free file option, as it's called, uh, was available to most Americans. But uh, the, the story of the 20 years since this deal was made is a story of the tax prep industry led by Intuit uh, taking steps to make sure as few Americans actually use this, this truly free option as possible. So uh, that's the history of it, sort of how we got to where we are today. The situation that Americans find themselves in today when it comes to tax prep is uh, if you go onto Google uh, and type in uh, file my taxes or file my taxes for free, um, you will be bombarded by advertisements from uh, Intuit for their product, TurboTax, from h &R Block, from uh, a whole host of other companies offering what are advertised as uh, quote unquote free tax filing options. Um, the fundamental trick that the industry has been playing on American tax filers for many years now is that there are two different uh, version, free versions of the software, and one is actually free, and the other uh, often leads you to pay a fee. So uh, the truly free option uh, is called IRS Free File. Uh, it's a .gov website. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there's a whole host of commercial products. The biggest one is, is called TurboTax Free, uh, which are actually very different than IRS Free File. If you are one of the people who ends up clicking on a link for TurboTax free or h &R Block free, um, essentially what happens is, uh, depending on your specific tax filing situation, if you have certain types of tax forms, certain types of income, for example, if you're, let's say, an Uber driver and you have uh, 1099s that you get uh, as part of your uh, Uber income, um, suddenly, if you are in TurboTax free version, um, after you've put in a lot of your information, you've, you've been uh, spending a lot of time with the software, uh, TurboTax will suddenly tell you, actually, to file this form, you have to upgrade to TurboTax Deluxe, which might cost $100, or maybe you have to upgrade to an even more expensive version of the software. Um, and what we showed in our reporting was that uh, there's literally millions of Americans every year who are uh, getting caught by this fundamental trick where they're clicking on an ad or product that's labeled as free, but then they get three quarters of the way through the process and suddenly they realize they have to pay to finish. Uh, even though these same people, if they had just found the right IRS site, the free file site would have been able to file actually for free using basically the same software. Um, there was a inspector general report uh, that looked at, at this issue um, uh, after our reporting uh, a couple of years ago. And, and the inspector general uh, found that 14 million Americans in 2019 at least 
um, had paid for tax prep uh, that they could have gotten for free through uh, the free file program. Um, so if you uh, if you're looking for the truly free tax prep option, uh, try to find the IRS free file version. It's you should start on a .gov site. So a lot of our reporting uh, for the last couple of years in the IRS is focused on the fact that the IRS has been starved of resources for the last 10 years, really. And it's not like it was drowning in resources before that started. So that, what that means uh, for people is that basic things, like if you would try to contact the IRS, um, a lot of times uh, it's hard to even get through to talk to someone. Um, any correspondence in the mail is going to take months on end to resolve. Um, and what we found is that uh, a lot of the cuts that happened as a result of uh, basically budget cuts to the agency, they've lost a lot of personnel. Um, and it's been a different story how people have been affected depending on how much income they have. So people at the top of the income uh, ladder have really benefited from this because if the IRS is uh, short-staffed, uh, what that means is a lot fewer audits are going to get done, um, particularly people who are upper income, because those sorts of audits are really resources intensive and take a really uh, skilled uh, agent to do them. Whereas people lower down the income scale often are really audited by computers. So uh, a computer might challenge, um, you know, someone's claim of a child on their tax return or ask them to prove up the fact that you know, they said they made this much money, uh, you know, freelancing or, or something like that. Um, and so you get a letter in the mail and um, it can be pretty intimidating to deal with. Um, and then you have to deal also with the fact that the IRS is short staffed and it's hard to get answers for anything. We found there's a real imbalance in the cuts of the agencies who's been impacted by that. So as Paul and Justin have probably already told you, after a decade of declining funding and staffing, the IRS was asked to do something in 2020 that was unprecedented, probably in its history, which was during a pandemic, get stimulus checks out to 160 million Americans essentially overnight. And what the pandemic meant for the IRS was like many federal agencies, they had to shift to remote work as quickly as possible. And that meant shutting down many of their processing centers. But the way that I, the IRS still works, much of it is still on paper. And so you had mail coming into these processing centers, piling up in tractor trailers, because nobody could get there to deal with it. And remember, the pandemic came in the middle of 2019 tax filing season. So if you filed a tax return by mail, you may not have heard back even yet. Um, and that causes a lot of trouble for people who normally depend on getting their dependable refunds back in a relatively prompt fashion. And then later on, it became important for stimulus checks. So, but let me go back to the summer and fall of 2020 when the IRS was trying to get stimulus checks to the people who really needed them the most. And often those were folks either without bank accounts or who hadn't ever filed taxes, at least recently. And those people all had to be asked to file a special form and reaching all of them was really difficult. So asking the IRS to cope with all these changing uh, protocols with less money, less staff, uh, less processing centers open and no extra money to do all this outreach that they were being asked to do meant that inevitably there was going to end up being a cascade of problems that continue into 2021. Now, they're being asked to do a second and third round of stimulus checks, which are getting progressively easier because they now know how to get the money out and how to find people. The IRS did get another one and a half billion dollars in the most recent stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, in order to try to modernize their systems and boost their staffing. But it's um, it's a paltry way to make up for uh, 10 years of declining funding. And it doesn't look like the problems are gonna get much better uh, just with that on an ongoing basis.
All right, I'm gonna um, bring back our panelists. Cool. Well, um, I know that was a lot of information, <laughs> a lot of different topics, a lot of different issues, a lot of different, um, you know, terms that um, were, um, were kind of discussed. And so hopefully um, this next panel discussion um, segment will um, clarify some of those questions. Um, you know, there are a lot of resources and information to help navigate this. For one, ProPublica has published a free tax guide full of free fact check tax information. And I'll make sure to drop the link in the chat box so everyone can have that. But we also have our panel, um, this great panel to share this information. Um, and if you have questions, and I see some folks are starting to, to send um, their questions in the, the chat box, which is great. Um, you can type that into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to answer them. We've also received some questions in advance that we'll, um, we'll try to address as well. So my first question for um, the, the panel, you know, at ProPublica, we found that a lot of people don't know where to turn when it comes to, you know, they have questions about their taxes. And so in addition to the IRS free file system that the video discussed, what are some free tax prep options that you've had experience with? And David, I'd love to hear from you first. Thanks, Simon. Uh, it's great to be here. And, and uh, on behalf of Code for America, it's great to partner with ProPublica to host this event tonight. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, yeah, I mean, as we heard in the videos, you know, the tax system is incredibly complicated, stress inducing uh, and confusing even in a normal year. And I think, you know, with the pandemic and all the tax law changes happening this year is, is probably one of the most confusing moments, I think, at least in, in my uh, memory of, uh, of tax season. So, um, there's a lot to be, you know, concerned about and, you know, uh, confused about and fearful of. But the, the good news is, you know, on the more positive light that there are a lot of um, trustworthy, trustworthy, free and kind of easy to access resources out there to help folks both file and uh, get their questions answered and kind of navigate um, this wild tax season that we're all involved in now. And where the tax season is more important than ever, obviously, since a lot of folks are suffering uh, during the pandemic and need access to this flexible cash and the refunds. Uh, as quickly as possible to help them get by. So, you know, one of the first resources I always refer people to uh, when thinking about uh, free tax resources is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, also known as VITA, the VITA program, uh, which is a public-private partnership. Um, it's overseen by the IRS, but it's actually administered by nonprofits across the country. It's led by folks like Jeffrey, who you'll hear from in a minute, who uh, are doing excellent work helping folks uh, get their taxes done. And it focuses on folks typically with um, you know, low to moderate income. So anyone with incomes below $57,000 a year, roughly, um, and that have relatively straightforward, not too complex um, tax returns um, to help them file. And Normally, you would go to uh, uh, you know a Vita site in person, and you'd be able to sit down with a volunteer that would help you kind of prepare your return. A highly trained volunteer uh, through a rigorous IRS program. Obviously, in the pandemic, that it's hard to find face-to-face -face, um, tax preparation, and that's where Get Your Refund, uh, which Code for America launched, helped. Uh, you know, came about. It started before the pandemic, but really kind of uh, ramped up during the pandemic to offer socially distant digital ways for folks to get their taxes prepared. There's a variety of different models, you know, that, you know, you can go to the, the website itself to learn more about it, getyourrefund.org. And there you can find out more about Get Your Refund, but you can also find access to local Vita sites like Jeffrey's or others if you're outside of New Mexico that are nearest to you. Um, but the great news is when you go there, you know, you can do your taxes almost entirely uh, digitally, virtually by uploading documents. And you can, there's a live chat function where you can ask questions with folks. Uh, if that's a little too much for you, there's also a variety of different models that are out there. Um, there's some phone support through 211 in the United Way. And there's also certain models where uh, we call Vita Valet, um, where you can kind of drop off your paperwork at a site um, in a safe manner. And then a volunteer will prepare your taxes and kind of uh, either text you or call you or contact you with questions and kind of guide you through the process. Uh, and there's a variety of different other models, um, depending on how comfortable you are and, and what your preferences are and what your Vita site offers. Uh, if you're someone who, you know, 
feels very brave and you're, you're fine doing your taxes by yourself, you would normally maybe use a TurboTax or some other type of software, but that's quite costly and um, may not be the route you want to go. There are online options that are free too. MyFreeTaxes.com offered by United Way is another great option for folks who are comfortable kind of going the, the do-it-yourself route. Um, the other route I would mention, uh, you know, if, if you're particularly brave that the IRS offers that is not the free file program is something called free fillable forms. Uh, it can often get confused when you're going on the IRS website between those two options, but free fillable forms is basically the paper form and electronic version, and you just have to fill it out and submit it. Um, that is available to anyone of any income. So again, you have to be brave and, uh, you know, be the person who's willing to do paper and kind of fill it out electronically and submit it. But, you know, if that's the route you want to go, um, uh, that's available to you. And, and the one thing I didn't mention uh, before when I was talking about VITA too, is that VITA has a sister program uh, that's focused on older Americans too. It's called the Tax Counseling uh, for Elderly Americans program. You know, particularly if you get pension income or if you have uh, more complicated social security cases, um, they can also help you with your tax situation as well if you find a, a TCE site. Um, for, and that's focused on lower income, older Americans, uh, anyone age uh, above the age of 60. So those are just a few of the options. Um, Jeffrey might know of some other local options too, New Mexico specifically. There's often other local options that are sometimes available as well, or might have other ideas as well, but those are some of the big ones. Uh, you are talking about the same things that I'm talking about. Um, when it, it came time to go virtual, uh, we were lucky enough to, to partner up with COVID for America and uh, getyourrefund.org uh, at the end of last tax season. And it was a, a great program to, to, to get us moving in, in this virtual direction. And as you mentioned, as we're talking about alternate ways to get your taxes done, which you can't do the face-to-face -face VITA, which I, I usually do every year. We can't do that because of our, our, our pandemic situation. The get your refund is the, in New Mexico, the way we are encouraging people to feel comfortable using what we're calling a end-to-end -end virtual model using their, their mobile device, their tablet, their computer, anything like that. Um, and the, the program itself is, is a, is a handhold. It walks you through what you need to do and you can use your own devices and you have your documents right there. So if you can capture those documents with your camera on your phone, you have access to this program and you have access to a great help system and a great real time help system to walk you through and answer you some of the questions that you have. So it's, it's as easy as you can get while still being in control of the process yourself from from start to end and, and do a good job and have, have proper people take take it do do proper taxes on it um and just as he said my free taxes uh that is what we call more of an interrogative program where you get in there and you say yeah i'm willing to do my own taxes but the program itself is going to ask you did you have a job last year if so well let me add what's in box one it's so it's going to walk you through the program so the myfreetaxes.com uh way to do your taxes is called do it yourself but it, it very much walks you through in a, in a sort of like i said interrogative question oriented way that that will get you out the other side it's not the same as having somebody else do it for you but those two ways that david mentioned are the exact best two ways we've tried to get to folks here in new mexico as an alternative to the the face-to-face -face model that we've been using in the past and we'll hopefully be using next tax season so i, I absolutely agree with those two the free file is something we've been encouraging since the beginning. Um, we give out three sources when they call us, which is the free file, which is the .gov free files, the my free taxes, and the getyourrefund.org. And that's pretty much getting us access to most people access to, to what they need one way or the other through those, those items. Awesome. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, David. And, you know, Jeffrey, my next question is really for you, too. Um, you know, we're talking about the pandemic. You're talking about transitioning to being virtual and not being able to help people, you know, in person. And so with the pandemic, we've also seen widespread job losses and a spike of unemployment, right, which, you know, adds to the, you know, the, um, the issues of, you know, filing taxes. And so what are ways that unemployment insurance uh, will affect people's taxes. For example, do you have to pay like pay um, taxes on it? Uh, what should people expect? Okay, um, this 
the question has the answer to this question has evolved over the past few weeks here uh, uh, nationally, federally, and uh, as well in New Mexico. Um, first of all, uh, in New Mexico, employment, if you receive unemployment, that's considered taxable income. So that's going to be put into your taxes, represented in your taxes as taxable income. And when you go to have unemployment insurance, they will ask you if you want to have federal taxes taken out for the simple purpose of it's going to be taxable later on. So if you do get unemployment, you probably do want to have taxes taken out. But what has happened, and David, you definitely have to be sort of my bumpers on this to keep me going down the lane straight here, is fairly recently, the federal government made $10,200 worth of unemployment excludable from income. So if you had unemployment of $10,200 or less, it will be excluded from your tax return. That obviously creates on the face of it some problems if you've already filed your taxes and you've already got your refund and you already paid the taxes on the unemployment that was on the original tax return. How does that work? And then how does it work moving forward on both federal and state levels? If you've already filed your taxes with unemployment on those tax returns, the guidance from the federal government just came out this week that said that they, the federal government, the IRS, is going to recalculate those unemployment tax returns and for lack of a better way to put it, send you the difference. There's no need to amend a tax return if you've already done it. This is gonna be a process done by the IRS. Now, that doesn't translate down to the state. Uh, here in the state of New Mexico, looks like we will probably have to do some sort of amendment to make that match on the state. We haven't heard final guidance from the state on exactly how to do that just yet. Um, but uh, so that's a that's just a big uh, that been in, unemployment has been in, in play recently for those reasons. But if you've already filed, it'll be taken care of on the federal level, New Mexico level. We're still waiting to hear guidance on that. And then moving forward, it's going to be in all the calculations on all your tax returns moving forward. So if you go to file your taxes, expect your unemployment to be in the technical terms is excluded up to ten thousand two hundred dollars. So for example, if you only had five thousand dollars worth of unemployment all of that would be excluded. If you had $10,500 worth of unemployment, there would still be $300 that would not be excluded. It's up to $10,200, right? So if you had $30,000 worth of unemployment, only $10,200 would be excluded from your taxable income, right? So it was, it's the same number for everybody. So unemployment is taxable. It's kind of in play right now, but if you've already filed, it's going to be taken care of by the feds and moving forward, it's going to be in the calculations for both the federal and the state. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, my next question is, you know, folks who are, um, you know, gig workers, right? You know, people who took on gig work to replace lost income during COVID, like driving for Uber, which, which is an example um, in uh, the video. How does that affect how their income is classified for their taxes. And um, either one of you feel free to jump in. Uh, David, I don't know if you have your set speech about the 1099 miscellaneous that's now the 1099 NEC and how a lot of people don't necessarily expect to be getting that form and how it turns them into a, a small business. Um, that's where we see some of the surprise, uh, but uh, what happens is if you drive for Uber, um, you get treated like a, it's called an independent contractor. And it, for lack of a better way to put it, that's being treated as a small business. And so when you're paid, you're paid as a small business person, you're not paid as an employee. So usually taxes aren't taken out on the federal level or the state level, or if you think about your W-2, there's no social security or Medicare withholding, all those kind of things taken out either. And so when it comes time to do your taxes, you as your own business are now responsible for your federal taxes, your state taxes, and what would be the employer's portion of those other social security taxes. And so it's, a, it's just a, with the gig economy, there's an opportunity for employers to treat employees not as employees to the benefit of the employer. And we see that utilized in the Uber, Lyft, that kind of situation where they're treated as independent gig worker drivers, 
but we also see it with uh, the construction industry where somebody says, would you like $500 a week to work or would you like you know $1,000 a week to work or whatever they're gonna pay them? And they say, I'd like that job and they get paid in cash every week. And then at the end of the year, they get a, a 1099 for $26,000, $27,000 and they end up owing $7,000 in taxes. Um, and most of the time it was the exploitation of a language barrier or exploitation of English as a second language where there was a misunderstanding on the part of the worker not getting that they're not being paid as an employee. Um, there's a, there's a, 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 an exploitation of that whole uh, loophole, so to speak. They tried to correct it a little bit by creating a singular form called a 1099 NEC. Uh, it's simply a new form for the same category. Same category. Uh, but again, gig workers are treated as small businessmen, and that's the big difference. And when you pay your taxes as a small businessman, you're not only paying your taxes as an independent citizen, but you're paying your taxes as that small businessman as well that's incorporated into your personal taxes. So there are different requirements like expenses and some other things that you would need to keep track of that a normal citizen wouldn't have to do. Okay. David, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think those are the big pieces that Jeffrey covered. Yeah, for 1099s. It's uh, unfortunately, especially in the pandemic, a lot of folks who lost their jobs who were on W-2s got a very nasty surprise kind of experiencing, you know, what it's like to receive a 1099 and be considered a consider a small business when uh, it's it's pretty clear that most people are not small businesses. They're working for, you know, companies like Uber or others, so. Thank you. My next question is about the earned income tax credit. That was a term that I just heard about really in the last few weeks, and that was also featured in the video. So David, um, who qualifies for it? And what what is the earned income tax credit? Who qualifies for it? Um, and what are the new rules for it this year? Yeah, the earned, in, earned income tax credit, I think, is it's one of the most impactful tax credits for kind of low and moderate income workers. It's a, it's a credit that's been around for a while, but it's slowly kind of increased in size and prominence. Uh, you know, you often hear about the earned income tax credit that it's refundable. That's the term that's used. And, and basically what that means is if you don't, you have a lower income and you don't have a liability, a tax liability, or it's already offset, uh, that you can still get a refund on top of that. So, um, you know, it can range anywhere. Refund sizes can range up to $6,600 roughly. It can be a quite a large credit for the for families with dependents who uh, fall in the right income levels. And, and once you start working, it slowly kind of ramps up in size and then it hits up, it's a point as it gets toward moderate income and slowly uh, starts to, to kind of level out for folks. But it, it's one of the biggest anti-poverty programs in the country. It really, it really makes a huge difference. And I think many folks... Uh, every year get a large refund and don't realize, you know, uh, that a, a good chunk of it sometimes is uh, to the credit of the earned income tax credit. It's a, it's a, it's a great program. One of the downsides, unfortunately, of the earned income tax credit, it's very confusing and it's complicated. And because of that, it leads to um, folks sometimes making honest mistakes, even professional tax preparers making mistakes when calculating the earned income tax credit or, you know, incorrectly uh, claiming a child or a dependent they think is eligible for the earned income tax credit when they aren't. And then this can lead to trouble with the IRS down the road for some folks, unfortunately, and has to get sorted out. You know, I think this is one of the reasons why I highly recommend another, yet another reason I would recommend uh, the VITA program is because, you know, VITA volunteers are highly trained. VITA has the highest accuracy rate of any type of tax preparation out there. It's in the nineties. I mean, even paid preparers, uh, don't get um, accuracy ratings quite as high as, as VITA volunteers because both the volunteers in the process, the review process are very thorough to make sure they get it accurately done for you. So I think, you know, I highly encourage folks to, number one, first look in to see if you're eligible for the earned income tax credit and definitely use the volunteer income tax assistance program if you are, because many, many people who do their taxes on their own sometimes forget to claim it and then they're missing out on a lot of money, you know, you know, there's, there's billions of dollars that are kind of left on the table each year because some folks fail to claim it. You know, I sent some estimates put it as high as one out of every five eligible tax filers for the DITC kind of miss out on it. And then Simon, as you mentioned, you know, the, the newest bill that just passed Congress, the, the American Rescue Plan enhances the ITC uh, even further. And this would not take place in this tax year, but it would be for the next tax year. 
And what it does, particularly a lot of the folks who miss out, the, the one out of five, are usually um, workers, but they don't have any dependents or they're not non-custodial parents and they're filing for themselves. In that case, the ITC can be a, a little bit lower than that larger number I threw out for you. It can be you know, as low as like $500 is you know, what folks can get. But under the new law, that's actually going to roughly triple. It'll be up to like $1,500 potentially uh, for, for single workers. So even, you know, even if you don't have a lot of dependents where the bigger refunds come into play for folks, it can still be a lot of money. And if you haven't filed in the past, you can, you know, if you go to your Vita site, and I'm sure Jeffrey does this all the time too, for folks who are, are not traditional filers who might be coming in because of all the, the stimulus payments, the EIPs and coming in to file, um, you know, you can file back taxes as well, and that can add up to a lot of money. And there's, you know, a lot of people are hurting right now, behind on rent, need money for food, you know, bills, you know, uh, because of dealing with the economic fallout of the pandemic. This is a huge uh, resource of money that's available to folks, and there are free, secure services that can help them. And it's your money, you know, this is the money you're entitled to, too. So we really encourage people to claim and file for it. Um, the ITC itself, you know, there are many other features we'll talk about, I'm sure more, but the ITC is one of the biggest, um, the biggest benefits out there for folks. Thank I you, David. Wanna, I just want to chime in that the earned income tax here in New Mexico, we have what's called the Working Families Tax Credit as well. And the Working Families Tax Credit is a credit specifically that shows up on the New Mexico tax return that is absolutely directly correlated to the earned income tax credit on the federal return. So if you get the earned income tax credit on the federal return, you're going to get the working families tax credit on the New Mexico return. It's roughly 10% of what you got on the federal return. So it's another good chunk of change. Again, to make sure it's a good idea, that's another reason to make sure all that earned income credit uh, information, child information, all that kind of stuff is correct, like David was saying, because if you get it in there and you're entitled to get it, it's, it's, it's a a good way to to make the system work for you, you know, and that's part of what by the product our program is about is making sure that programs like EITC and child tax credit get uh, utilized by the people that it's there for. You know what I mean? That if it's there, that you that you get that. And so those are the kind of programs that we want to make sure you see when you you come to see see people like Vida. Um, if you think I was just going to say with David, if you in New Mexico, if you think of the, he was talking about the TCE programs in New Mexico. Uh, there's basically two ways to get your taxes done if you're talking about the free tax preparation. There's Tax Help New Mexico, and then what most people associate with, uh, which is the TCE, is uh, the AARP programs that are around here in New Mexico. So here in New Mexico, you can think of the, the program David discussed about the, the little more complicated returns for the older Americans that uh, that's the TCE program. That's the AARP programs here in, in New Mexico. And then the other programs around the state of the tax help New Mexico programs, but just to clarify that, because here in New Mexico, we, they, most people would see it as the, one of the AARP programs for the TCE thing. No, thank you for clarifying and localizing um, that. Um, my next question is about the IRS. So what if someone has is having trouble with the IRS, um, they can't get something sorted out or they're getting audited, what resources can people access for problems like this? David, let me start first. Yeah, happy to jump in, Simon. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the first things that you, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, these things come as mail audits, you know, you'll get like a very large threatening letter from the IRS that shows in your mailbox. And I think it's natural human um, reaction is to kind of panic and maybe try to ignore it and hope the problem goes away and kind of bury it under the mail pile. Uh, and I can, I can tell you this, that is the absolute worst thing that you can do because the IRS will not forget that they sent you that letter. I, I think one of the most important things you can do is, you know, usually that, you know, they can be complicated, but they're written in plain English. They've been kind of long, but like, you know, make sure you review it, make sure it looks roughly accurate to you and seek out help. You know, I think you can low income taxpayer clinics are a great resource um, uh, to help people with more complicated cases. If you're in a confused situation, you know, so I think, you know, that can be a great resource for folks who feel like they don't know where to turn about it. Um, you know, as we heard in the videos at the beginning, you know, the IRS itself, you know, does have lines open and resources where you can contact them to get further information. And that's not a bad route to go either. Uh, but, you know, they are severely understaffed. Anyone who's tried to call the IRS knows that you can get disconnected. You can be on hold for a very long time. You know, recommendations are usually to call really early in the morning. Um, which would be quite, you know, is usually around 8 a.m. Eastern time, which is really early, quite early New Mexico time. Um, 
But, you know, if you want to go that route and try to talk to someone at the IRS, that's not a bad way to go either. But I do, you know, whenever it comes to, you know, uh, whenever you're, you know, my experience with Vita sites and folks who owe money or run into problems with it, you never want to ignore the issue with the IRS. You can negotiate with the IRS. You can do payment plans if it's an issue. You can get things settled. So, you know, don't feel like, you know, if they, if you get a big number, if you get an audit, um, letter from them that, you know, you have to do everything immediately and then, or else they're going to come after you. Uh, the other thing I should really clarify about is the IRS doesn't really call you. No one's, you know, there's a lot of sc scams out there where they say like you owe us money and the IRS is going to arrest you or they're going to show up at your door and, you know, you need to do this and that, you know, I, I can guarantee you that that is typically, you should be very skeptical if you get one of those calls and it's very highly likely to be a scam that no one will call you like that to kind of threaten you in that way. And I think a lot of people have been taken advantage of by pieces like that. Um, you will get something in the mail if they're auditing you and it'll look very official from the IRS. And like I said, you know, calling the IRS, contacting your local, your low income taxpayer clinic. If you have questions too, you can go to folks like Jeffrey as well. You know, Vita sites may not be able to help, can't, you know, represent you in an audit defense or do any of those pieces, but they can help you understand some of the basic steps and point you uh, to local resources in order to kind of help you get through this. Uh, we get a lot of the the letters that come back and and I, I usually say or people are afraid of the letters coming back as well but I usually say it's they're going to send you a letter that says they're going to come you know eat your children and burn down your house and it's going to be a horrible thing but if you just read through the letter they're also going to explain to you what's going on and what they want you to do and they may not want you to do what you think they want you to do they may just want one form related to another form. They may not want you to redo your taxes. They may not want this or that or the other at all. So it, it, it's the, the, the IRS just wants to communicate with you and just wants to settle the score, so to speak, and, and get into an engagement and get their money. They're just basically a collection agency. And so as David said, the best thing to do always is to not throw away the letters and not do that. The, 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 that's not the pathway to getting along with the IRS at all. You need to get in communication with them as soon as possible because they will work with you. They will figure out something with you as well because in the end, they want their money. No, thank you for clarifying that. Um, this next question is also related to the IRS. So um, with the backlog of paperwork at the IRS due to not only the processing of the stimulus checks, but also the pandemic, um, in addition to the decade of declining funding, <laughs> what are you seeing? Are you seeing delays in tax returns and what kind of time frame should people expect this year? Yeah, I'm happy to start on this one. You know, the IRS, you know, as we heard in the video, they're under considerable stress, you know, in the past, you know, if you e-filed, they had these tables, which are pretty reliable about like the date that you filed and when you would get your refund. That has obviously all kind of gone out the window. Um, you know, the biggest thing we've heard, you know, it really depends on your return and kind of what's going on with it. And, uh, you know, I think anything that's flagged for complications, for example, you know, we've heard from a lot of folks who, you know, uh, the recovery rebate credit, you know, if you didn't receive one of the first two EIP, uh, stimulus payments or EIPs, or maybe you didn't get the correct amount and you need to amend for that. We're hearing from a lot of folks, you know, that is getting flagged and kind of set aside and taking a little bit longer as the IRS kind of checks the records to, to reconcile and make sure the, the payments are going to the right place, you know, being short staffed and, you know, they're trying to still haven't finished getting out the third round of EIPs and they're dealing with the unemployment uh, issue to reconcile that Jeffrey brought up earlier. There's a lot of pieces and still trying to finish you know, tax forms in 2019, in some cases, the paper ones in particular are, are, are pretty bad. You know, we are recommending to everyone, whatever you do, like, don't file by paper if you can help it by any means, try to do it electronically. <laughs> you know, paper is always slower, but in this case, it's, you know, it's, it's the time frame for getting a response or getting, you know, uh, everything through is even more ridiculous um, just because of the pandemic and handling physical paper and those types of things, in addition to all the other burdens that the IRS is dealing with. But, you know, roughly, you know, we've heard from folks, if you don't have some kind of uh, issue in your return that's flagged, and that doesn't mean there's something wrong with your return necessarily, or that, you know, you did anything wrong, it just means it's getting closer review by the IRS, and they just have limited folks to do that. 
because uh, again, they're social distancing like everybody and trying to treat this properly, that that can slow down your return. But roughly around two months is you know what we've heard from the IRS for a lot of these returns at the most. Um, but again, if you don't hear anything, the IRS has the get my the get my payment tool on the website. You can go on there and look. You know there are different levels. Sometimes you know there've been stories about people that just doesn't have information for them, or that's not clear what the status is or the timeline is. But if there is any uh, detailed information, that's one of the best places to go uh, when looking for this. And you know the other thing I would say, I know everybody wants their refund quicker. Like I said, we're in the pandemic, especially now. But people shouldn't panic. You know things will get processed, and you know. Even particularly a lot of people asking questions about EIPs or stimulus payments and trying to figure out, oh, do I have to claim it now or do I have time for this? The IRS has made clear that you can still claim all these things if there's an error with it, you can still get it reconciled you know, for several years down the road, up to three years down the road to get these things reconciled. So you won't miss out on these things. But you know, we do encourage everyone because of all the benefits overall, definitely file a 2020 tax return, definitely file earlier and definitely do it electronic if you can and, and be patient. Yeah, from my side, it's just anything with paper is just not moving. So we're doing everything we can to avoid paper. Obviously, there's some glitches with the 19s that are still stuck out there, some amended returns that got sent out by some of our sites that have disappeared in there. But electronically is is absolutely uh, the way to go if you, can, if you can get it done that way. Just definitely avoid paper is my only thing on this one. Avoid the paper. Yeah, thank you. I think that's the biggest takeaway <laughs> during these times. Um, great. Well, we'll um, we have some audience Q and A from you know um, from folks who previously submitted. Also, some folks feel free to um, please submit any questions you may have um, as we um, you know we have about ten minutes left or so. So you know we'll try to get to your questions. But David, you had just talked about you know making sure that folks file for you know the twenty twenty taxes. But what if folks didn't file for last year? Um, should they? Um, what would you suggest or recommend? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Simon. You know, I think, you know, it, again, this is an unusual tax year in, in many ways, some good, some bad. But I think, you know, we're encouraging everyone, you know, to file whether, you know, for 2019, for, for, for this year, if you didn't file for last year, you could, like I said, you can file for three years back. You know, typically, you know, there's a there's a minimum income level for folks who don't need to file. If you fall below it, um, you can still file, but it's optional. And in many cases, you know, for some folks, it would make a difference. For others, it wouldn't. But you know, we've entered this new realm, <laughs> you know, with um, with all the relief, the COVID relief, where even if you have no income whatsoever, obviously, you can qualify for stimulus payments um, if you meet certain conditions. We have the, you know. Jeffrey mentioned the child tax credit, part of the new tax law uh, expands the child tax credit before it wasn't eligible to, for really low income families that had low incomes um, or no incomes. It wasn't refundable, fully refundable as the earned income tax credit is. Now it is fully refundable. So again, that means even if you don't have a tax liability, you can still receive this benefit. And the child tax cre uh, credit benefit is, is quite large as well. You know, it can be... Um, you know, 3,000, it's been expanded to $3,000. It depends on your income, but for, for, for lower income folks, it can be $3,000 for children uh, up to 17. And for younger children, six and below, it can be um, uh, $3,600 per child, which is quite a sizable amount of money. It, it's going into effect not for this tax season. So this is where it can get confusing for some folks. It's going into effect not for this tax season, but for the next tax season, like the EITC change, but they're doing a piece where you can claim it in advance starting um, at least theoretically, again, the IRS has to implement this, they got a lot on their plate, but starting in July, folks can start receiving it in monthly installments in advance, half the credit they would get. So for folks, it could be $250, $300 per child that they could start receiving in advance. The IRS is gonna release new information on this. They're gonna uh, yeah, set up a portal that allows people to um, you know, change their family information or payment information and address information. But, you know, because of all these benefits, it's a long story, but I think, you know, because of all these benefits, we're encouraging people, to, everyone to file. Um, and this is, again, why Vida is a great resource. Go in, file electronically, file for back taxes if you can. Again, you know, it can set you up for future payments that might be coming down the road for many years to come. But it also, you know, we've seen folks get incredibly large um, uh, you know, refunds that hadn't filed in the past. And you add that up with all the EIPs, child tax credit, earned income tax credit, if they're eligible. So it's, it's really to everyone's advantage to file and, and to, you know, this is the time more than ever to get in there and do it. 
we're encouraging everybody to file their 2020s this year for basically stimulus purposes just to get in there and get the books. Now, we have a lot of folks in New Mexico who did not receive their stimulus payments, and we have a lot of folks in New Mexico who didn't do their 2019s. And so we've been doing a lot of both 19s and 20, and specifically, as David just said, if you didn't do your 19s, you didn't do them for a lot of people because they didn't have the income requirements or anything like that. But we are suggesting that you file the 2020s to for the stimulus payments, basically. And we actually put together a, a one pager for uh, various groups around town here in Albuquerque to use the myfreetaxes.com DIY program to specifically go in and do nothing else but claim your stimulus payments at this point if you had no income. So. 2000 or 2020 is definitely a tax year that you need to, to, to file taxes for to make sure you're in the game for everything that's going on this year. And then, as you said, you also have three years to go back. But 2020 this year, whether you had taxable income or you earned money or however you, you are situated this year, you should file for 2020 to make sure you're eligible for whatever's coming down the pipeline. No, thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, David. Yeah, and that was one of the questions people, someone did ask, ask, ask a late actually ask, um, uh, can you still get a stimulus payment if you haven't filed taxes for 2019, right? And I think that, um, you know, we were able to hear that you are able to still do that. Um, Jeffrey, I was, I was curious about um, a, another question about unemployment. What happens if someone um, gets unemployment from a state that they don't currently live in? What is that process like? What should they know? Well, that's basically, as I said, it's gonna be income. So that's gonna be technically income from another state. And so when you're doing your taxes, either the program you're using or the preparer that you're talking to is going to ask you, were you a resident of the state we are now in or were you a resident of the state that we got this unemployment from? Because if we're doing a tax year, it would have been in the same year. Okay? So it wouldn't have been an unemployment from a previous year or anything like that. So during this particular tax year, which state were you the citizen uh, resident of? Based on that determination, whether if you were a resident of New Mexico and your income, unemployment was from out of state, New Mexico might have a different way of dealing with that income than let's say Pennsylvania might. New Mexico is gonna count that unemployment as income and is gonna give you some credit for the taxes you would have paid in the other state, but other states would do it differently. But uh, you just have to report it uh, with each state as you are defined as a resident. But if you made money in a state and you paid taxes in a state, you have some tax responsibilities in that state, depending on what kind of resident you were in that state. So it would be a basis on which state you lived in the most and that kind of stuff. No, thank you. Oh, I'm just trying to look at our questions. Um, uh, one question we got was, um, you know, our paper federal forms received in February still good? Or did they, the recent COVID relief law make them obsolete? That's kind of a good question. Um, I have not, are you, I assuming since David talked about them earlier, the paper fileable forms that you can get online, um, we've had the changes that have flown, uh, have flowed all the way down into our day-to-day -day tax preparation from the IRS into our local, into our, our preparation system that we use, our commercial preparation system. So if it got that far, I'm hoping that it got onto the actual IRS printable forms, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, that is a good question, actually. Yeah, because the software that we use has definitely been updated to take that into account. Um, but yeah, you know, normally I would say the IRS, I would hopefully would have updated the forms by now, but, you know, given the COVID situation and the other things going on, it's quite possible that they haven't. So yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think that's really, you know, the questions that we've been able to cover more broadly. I just want to thank David um, and Jeffrey for taking the time today um, to be our panelists and for such an informative discussion. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us and for asking questions. Again, you'll receive an email tomorrow with some of the resources that we talked about tonight, as well as the full video of tonight's discussion. And I just wanna say from all of us at ProPublica and Code for America, thank you for joining us. Have a great night and we'll see you next time.